politically and economically to the point where hopefully in the not too distant future we'll be able to merge our system with theirs and of course with those of the rest of the world to form some kind of a world brotherhood a world union a world government to be exact which by definition would hold a monopoly over all these weapons of mass destruction and then nuclear war between nations finally would be impossible for the simple reason that there no longer would be any nations including our own there would remain only a group of disarmed political subdivisions of an all-powerful world government of course the grand designers scoff at the suggestion that such a concentration of power in one place might ideally be suited for a total consolidation of control into the hands of a small group of power-hungry world politicians. They particularly scoff at the possibility of this power falling into communist hands through the tactics used so successfully by their agents working within every other coalition government in which they've ever participated. We're assured that since this would be a world coalition government, for that reason the communists wouldn't try to seize power they'd be content merely to share in it. Well, without going into that particular little fantasy, just for the sake of discussion, let's grant the point and assume that a world coalition government with the communists really would result in a merger of our systems rather than the domination of theirs over ours. What then? Well, first of all, we would have to be willing to give up certain things that we would rather retain, such as our sovereignty and our independence. In other words, we must be willing to abide by the political dictates of the majority of other nations. One man, one vote in a world democracy. We must merge our monetary system with those of other nations, eventually to form a world currency. We must willingly submit all international disputes to a world supreme court and abide by those decisions regardless of the outcome. And above all, we must turn over our most powerful weapons and even our armies to international control so that the new world government will possess sufficient military might to compel the various political subdivisions by force, if necessary, to comply with the dictates of its laws and the decrees of its court. Now, to be sure, we'd prefer not to have to do any of these things, because obviously, if we're going to merge with other countries, other cultures, other legal systems and political ideologies, we can't expect the whole world to adopt our way of doing things. It'll be a give-and-take situation in which we'll have to seek a common denominator, a middle ground between our way of life and the way things are done in other parts of the world. And, of course, the result of such a compromise of systems predictably would have to be a mixture of the volatile dictatorships of Latin America, the tribal customs of newly emerging Africa, and the socialist regimes of Europe and Asia. Add to this concoction the necessity to absorb the doctrines and methods of communist regimes, and it's rather obvious that we're just going to have to give up certain cherished traditions and customs and learn to adjust to a way of life substantially different from that which we inherited. But it won't be so bad. We'll get used to it, and future generations won't know the difference. Besides, we really don't have any choice in the matter. It's that or the bomb. So let's get on with the job of putting an end to our own nationhood, as it has been historically defined. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the men who have formulated this grand design consider themselves to be part of the intellectual elite. In other words, in their opinion, they're just a little smarter than the rest of us. They feel that the average American doesn't quite have the intelligence or the aptitude to understand the wisdom of their grand design. As a matter of fact, they're rather worried that if enough of the American people suddenly discovered what was really going on, they might get out of hand and insist on their leaders doing something silly, like winning for a change. <laughs> and so in order to keep us contented at the polls, and to prevent us from asking too many questions, 
Sometimes it's necessary for them to put up a pretty good show of standing firm against the communists, to make some strong nationalistic statements now and then, and perhaps even to get us involved in some limited wars, which, although they're clearly not in waged in any way to endanger the enemy or weaken his position, still, with the daily loss of American lives in a shooting war against communists, who would dare suggest that our foreign policy is soft on communism? And in this way, the grand designers are confident that the American people will remain satisfied that their leaders are really standing firm and doing all that is humanly possible but in reality, ladies and gentlemen, they're merely buying time. It's their plan that the old-timers among us, those of you who have been raised with those old-fashioned and outmoded concepts of patriotism and love of country, that in time, your generation will pass away, or at least become the minority voice. And at the same time, they're catching the younger generations coming up through the high schools and the colleges, like they caught me, and the grand designers are confident that in just a few more years, especially if they can lower the voting age, the political majority of the American people can be conditioned to accept the total abandonment of our national sovereignty. Well, now I realize that for those of you who have never before heard the grand design spelled out in detail like this, it's almost impossible to believe that it's real. And there may be some of you who are wondering if perhaps I just haven't dreamed up all this. So let's turn now to the actual words and the documents of those men who not only fully endorse the grand design, but those who have been instrumental in creating it in the first place and who helped to put it into action. Now I'm going to try not to bore you with a lot of long quotations, but in order to give you some idea of just how real and consistent this grand design is, I think it's necessary to offer concrete examples from a broad spectrum of American leadership and over a wide time span. For the philosophy which I've just summarized has been held and preached for many years by opinion molders and the communications media, by congressmen and senators, by high-ranking personnel in all agencies of the federal government, by secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, Supreme Court justices, and even presidents of the United States. A good place to begin is with a speech delivered by Joseph E. Johnson on February 2nd, 1959. Mr. Johnson, as you may recall, formerly was the number one man in charge of our State Department Policy Planning Division. But at the time of these remarks, he was president of the Carnegie Endowment Fund for International Peace, one of the many tax-exempt foundations that all together spend each year millions of dollars just to promote the grand design. Now, speaking at a luncheon in New York, Joseph E. Johnson said, and this is a direct quote, From now on, every decision facing the United States in this foreign policy field must be taken in light of the fact that a good part of the country could be destroyed. We must be prepared to fight limited wars, limited as to weapons and as to goals, to stabilize the situation temporarily, tide things over, but victory is no longer possible. Well, moving from the State Department now to the Defense Department and to the Pentagon, we come across this article syndicated by the Associated Press on February 4th, 1968, entitled Robert S. McNamara, Reflections After Seven Years on the Hot Seat. And I think you'll find most revealing this direct quote from our former Secretary of Defense. It became clear that we couldn't win a strategic nuclear war. The concept of massive retaliation was ruled out. Then it was necessary to educate the public and the Congress that we couldn't win a strategic nuclear war. We said it in different ways over a period of time. I consider getting that concept across our greatest single accomplishment. Well, in the transcript of the hearings before the Senate Armed Services Committee on February 25th, 1966, again we find McNamara testifying, this time officially as our Secretary of Defense. And he said, to declare war in Vietnam 
would add a new psychological element to the international situation. Since in this century,